John R. Faison Sr. is the senior pastor of Watson Grove Baptist Church, a.k.a. The Grove, a growing, multi-generational, multi-site church with campuses in Nashville, Tennessee and Franklin, Tennessee. The Grove endeavors to be a growing church for growing people whom Christ will use in growing his kingdom. Pastor Faison is a highly sought after communicator of the gospel. Young and seasoned alike have been blessed by his message of allegiance and authenticity, as well as his willingness to deal with relevant issues. Pastor Faison's dexterity with different audiences stem from his broad spectrum of experiences. Pastor Faison is blessed with influence that extends beyond the local church. He is a passionate advocate for community transformation and development as seen in his work as an HIV and AIDS national ambassador with the NAACP, mentor in public school districts, and advisor to several community organizations. Pastor Faison is the proud father of three amazing children, John Jr., Aja, and Jaden. Everyone, please welcome Pastor John Faison. If you know God is worthy to be praised tonight, would you give him a praise right there? Come on, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let's go to God. Let's go to God in prayer tonight. God, thank you. Thank you for the manifold expressions of grace that you offer to us on a daily basis. Thank you, Lord, for another E.K. Bailey preaching conference. Another moment wherein we are postured and poised to hear from you. We pray, Lord, that as we gather tonight in word and worship, that you will continue to have your way. Thank you, Lord, for all that our eyes have seen and ears have heard, how our hearts have been stirred the more already. I pray that now, Lord, as we go forward in word and worship, that you'll continue to be with us. God, we pray unselfishly tonight. We pray that you would not only bless us, but strengthen our neighbor to our left and to our right, and even those who may be worshiping and experiencing this moment in the virtual space. Thank you, God, that my neighbor is the evidence that you're still a keeper. Everything that's been assigned to them has failed. And they still stand here declaring the works of the living God. Now, Lord, my personal prayer is that you'll let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Allow it to be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God, preach through me, pre preach to me, preach for me. Send a word, Lord, so that your people are edified, but in everything your name is glorified. I bless you for the treasure that you've placed in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Punish not your people now for the frailty of your preacher. Allow me to say it the way you want it said. God, my power is not enough. I need yours. My strength is insufficient. I need you. Have your way. Do what only you can do. Say what only you can say. And we will be careful to give you glory, honor, praise, and credit. Both now and forever. The blessed people of God say it, amen. Come on, if you receive that, give God praise one more time in God's house. We are absolutely grateful to God for the wonderful opportunity that we have to share in this sacred space called Sanctuary one more time at the E.K. Bailey Preaching Conference. Would you help me to praise God for the pastor of this people, the angel of this assembly, and the leader. Amen. You can do better than that. The leader of our convening. Amen. 
Pastor Brian Carter. Come on, give God praise for him. Grateful to you, sir, for your kindness, for your trust, for your hospitality, for your generosity. We also praise God for the Concord Church. Amen. Those of us who are pastors understand that moments like this don't happen as efficient and as effectively as they are happening without the investment of members, volunteers, servants, those who make it happen. So we are grateful. Amen. Grateful for you tonight. To Dr. Maurice Watson. Really? That's how you feel. <laughs> it's been, been pivotal to my, to my journey and to my life as both preacher and pastor, and I honor you, sir, as a prophet of the Lord. But did he not bless us tonight? My God. Amen. Amen. To all of you, my dear father's children, it is indeed a joy and good to be here. Friends, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We want to begin our sojourn tonight in verse 1. And we're going to end our reading at verse 6. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Pray that it will be beneficial to you as we share tonight. Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Here's what the word says from the New Living Translation. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees of, in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. You will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Two. This is the word of the Lord. Might the people of God say amen. 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 I want to talk tonight, the Holy Spirit's guidance, and with your prayers from the subject, I know the answer. I know the answer. Friends, humans are wired for routine. What we think and consume regularly becomes habit very quickly. Once ingrained, our views form subconsciously and without much convincing, they become a part of who we are. Then those views begin to shape how we see the world. The danger in our wiring for routine is that we can adopt particular views without interrogating them first. See, routine can make us so ingrained in something that we have to be convinced to stop it, even if we didn't have to be convinced to start it. This is why it's harder to break a habit than it is to make a habit. I hear you, you probably don't believe me yet. So I'll try to prove it to you. I want you to repeat this word after me. Are you ready? Say silk. 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 Silk, silk, what do cows drink? Cows don't drink milk. Cows 
drink water. Now, I, I can see you. You are looking at me bewildered because you think I fooled you. I did not fool you. I simply showed you how easy it is to wire you. You don't believe it? I'll try it again. Say this word after me. Pop. 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 What do you do at a green light? You don't stop at a green light. You go. Can I explain what just happened? Friends, I help you become so familiar with something that you assumed your familiarity would always be the correct approach. But friends, that assumption made you miss an actual question that needed to be answered. In fact, you never even listened to the question because you assumed you already knew the answer. Such is the case when we read a passage like Genesis chapter 3. You see, we have been theologically, culturally, and educationally conditioned that this passage is just about the fall of man. See, we know the story so well that we can tell it without ever even referring to it. Th those, those of us who grew up in church have been inundated with this story from Sunday school to BTU to YPWW to vacation Bible school to children's church. We can even quote some of the sermons that we've heard on the fall of man. Snakes and apples dominate our understanding. Because in our minds, Genesis 3 is the narrative of the fall of humanity. It is the space where sin entered into the world. It's the spot, the place where death became a human reality. But what if our familiarity has clouded our ability to hear the actual questions that the text may be asking? What if We've taken our routine scriptural templates and made them overlays to the passage. What if the questions we need to wrestle with, we cannot even be exposed to because we think we already know the answer? Friends, Old Testament theologian Walter Brueggemann, asserts a similar challenge to the reading of Genesis chapter 3. He asserts that at the heart of this particular narrative is not merely the fall of man, the entrance of sin, nor the reality of human death. Instead, Brueggemann argues that this passage is a, and I quote, theological critique of human anxiety. Brueggemann argues that this particular passage might just be giving us a mirror view of the effect and the impact of human anxiety. You, 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 human, human anxiety. The, the, the uneasiness provided by unchallenged doubts and fears that can lead to a distrust of God. Said it too fast, I'll say it again. Hum human anxiety, beloved, is the uneasiness 
provided by unchallenged doubts and fears that can lead to a distrust of an almighty God. Tonight, beloved, if, if, if I may, I want to lean on Brother Brueggemann for a moment. Because what, what, what if there is in this text an abiding anxiety that we often miss because we already know the story. Because we already know the answers, perhaps we miss the question that triggers it all. The serpent initiates the dialogue. In Genesis chapter 3, he begins with a discussion with the woman by asking this question. Verse 1, he says, did God really say that you must not eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And the woman's reply to the question is, as it probably should be, a summation of God's requirements. She says to the serpent, of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees, except for the tree in the middle of the garden. Because if we touch it or eat from it, we will die. The serpent now begins to dissect God's command. You ain't going to die. God knows that your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Br Brueggemann here says, says that the serpent uh, is the first in the Bible to practice theology in place of obedience. Watch, watch. Watch what he does. Watch what he does. He, he, he gets the woman to stop talking to God and start talking about God. God goes from essential to now being optional and an accessory. He, 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 gets, he gets the sister to stop seeing God's rule as a safe place for her existence, and he gets her to explore it as a barrier with which she must get around through intellect, creativity, and ingenuity. The serpent gets both the man and the woman to stop focusing on their assignment, tending and protecting the garden, and gets them now focused on self-preservation. How can I take care of me? And by verse 6, they are both convinced. The Bible says she eats, gives some to him, and he eats too. It's a swift, painful transition to watch. Because in verse 6, the man and the woman arrive at a place called disobedience but that was not where they started how did they get there so quickly I mean that's a quick that's a quick trip they went from quoting God in verses 2 and 3 to disobeying God in verse 6 how do you get there that fast. May, may, may I suggest, beloved, that they arrive at disobeying God because they began at distrusting God. Too fast. One more time. May, may, maybe they arrive at disobeying God because they started their journey at distrusting God. It, 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 it was their anxiety, beloved, that started it all. It's anxiety, I want to argue tonight, that they did not take to God. 
And because of that, anxiety already had them distrusting God before the serpent ever opened his mouth. And all it took was a little prompting before they were pushed over the edge. And once they are in disobedience, it's hard to get out. Because now they are afraid of God. They hide themselves because he's coming. They are scared of being naked. So they get fig leaves, put them in places to cover their newly perceived nakedness. They are scared of each other. So when it's time to get on the carpet, one blames the other for their own actions. Friends, might I argue tonight, that's what anxiety does. It creates a vicious, destructive cycle. And when that anxiety is closeted and unyielded, it leads to a distrusting of God. Distrusting God then makes us begin to take matters into our own hands. And once we start trying to control our lives apart from trusting God, we quickly realize we ain't equipped for such a responsibility. So we descend deeper into the quicksand of anxiety, only this time it's more intense. But now we've already built the muscle memory around distrusting God. So we revert back to that toxic reflex. And the cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. Distrusting children of God will become anxiety-filled shells of themselves. And anxiety always develops a taste for fruit that can kill us. I said it too fast. I'll say it again. When we operate in perpetual distrust of God, distrusting children of God become anxiety-filled shells of ourselves. We don't even recognize who we are anymore. The boldness has diminished. The confidence fades and dissipates. The strength and the power of our connection to God begins to evaporate and we become shells of the people God called us to be. And anxiety will always develop a taste in your mouth for fruit that can kill you. You, you, you. you might not want to admit it, but, but I'm talking to people tonight who know something about fruit tasting. You, 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 you started ministry trusting God for everything. If you needed something, you prayed for it. If something got in your way, you said, I'm going to stand still. Let the Lord fight my battles. Times got difficult and tough. You didn't run away. You turned up the spiritual temperature in your life. You fasted, turned down your plate, got on your knees before God and watched God work a miracle in your life. You served and God provided you stood and God defended you. You ministered to others and God blessed your house as you blessed his. But somewhere along the way, the pressure of leadership and the responsibility became more than you expected. Life started lifing. And people started to people. 
and the rigors of ministry began to take their toll. The disasters that you didn't anticipate began to mount. Pandemics showed up. Troubles started to arise. Suddenly you got more questions than answers. Money got funny. Home got crazy. Church got unpredictable. And you made the mistake of Genesis chapter 3. You did not take your anxiety to God. And a serpent came and asked you the right question at the wrong time. Do you remember your serpent? Did God really tell you to be faithful to this call? You can go do something else. Look at all these preachers. God doesn't need you. Do you remember your serpent? Did God really tell you to be faithful to Scripture? You can go preach some other doctrine. You know the kind that draws crowds and money. It'll be fine. Do you remember your serpent? Did God really tell you to live a life of integrity and dedication. I mean, look at all the people who live raggedy and God still takes care of them. You can do it too. Do you remember your serpent? Does God really appreciate your investment? Look at your life. You've lost some people on this journey. You've lost some of yourself. Look at your grief and your angst. All of this for ministry? This ain't really worth it. And before you knew it, anxiety, pressure, nervousness, frustration, Discontentment had turned into distrust. And distrust turned into disobedience. I'm talking tonight to preachers who live on the other side of Genesis chapter 3. I'm talking tonight as a brother who lives on the other side. Of Genesis chapter 3. We let anxiety make us distrust God and distrust when properly prompted moves you and I into disobedience. Friends, what are we supposed to do? Anxiety, beloved, is part of the human experience. Anxiety is a common human emotion. How do you avoid the inevitable? Came to tell you tonight, beloved, you can't avoid anxiety. Instead, you got to address it. And you address it first by taking it to God. I know you're used to praying for everybody else. But beloved, it might be time for you to put their prayer list down and pick yours up. I know you're used to always having the answers so you can't look in front of the people who trust you like you lost. But I came to tell you, as long as you keep playing Superman, you'll never be rescued. As long as you keep denying the anxiety that is ripping your soul apart, you cannot be pulled from the tempting tantrums of distrust and disobedience. You got to give your anxiety 
to God. And let me be clear tonight. Giving your anxiety to God is not always going to remove it. Just because you lay it at his feet doesn't mean it won't come and find your house, knock on your door, and force itself in again. Anxiety that is brought to God is not always going to be removed, but when you consistently and perpetually lay it at the feet of Jesus, it will disable that anxiety from being able to morph into distrust. Because anything that you lay at the feet of Jesus is in good hands. As we cast our cares upon the Lord, we get reminded that the Lord really does care for us. As we engage in the spiritual discipline of putting down and laying aside weight that so easily besets us and laying it at God's feet, often that's the reminder that's enough to help us keep grounded in our trust of an almighty God. We didn't know it, but the psalmist was right. I must tell Jesus. All of my trials, I've tried it, and I cannot bear these burdens alone. I've discovered that in my distress, he'll kindly help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. Dr. Watson told us tonight, We've got a supreme caretaker of the universe. Last time I checked, he did not abdicate his authority to any of us. So if God is going to be up all night, you might as well lay down tonight and say, God, it is what it is. I'm putting it at your feet. I've tried to fix it. I can't fix it. I've tried to handle it. I can't handle it. I've tried to think through it, and I can't figure it out. So God says, you're going to be up. I'm going to leave it to you. Well, I believe that's what God designed to help us. But what help is there? for the man and the woman in Genesis 3. A better way to ask the question is, what is God's answer to their anxiety? And, and, and maybe, what, what do we do if we've already let anxiety push us over into distrust and disobedience? I can see God raising his hand, saying, I know the answer. Because God's answer to anxiety is grace. God's, God's response to our frustration and our uneasiness that even leads and morphs into distrust and disobedience is grace. But how about that? How, how, how does grace look in the garden? Uh, gra gra grace, grace, grace looks uh, at least one or two ways. Uh, gra grace looks like protection. Let the church say protection. Man and woman violated God's law. According to God's command to said man and woman, it is that if you touch or eat of this tree, you will surely die. They violated, and they should have died. But the shout here is, God 
not only kept them alive, but helped them remain productive. Too fast. Man and woman violated God's law. They were supposed to die. God, in dealing with them, keeps them alive and helps them remain productive. You're not shouting because you haven't seen yourself yet. Let me help you. You and I have violated God's law not one time. Time after time after time after time. And we should have died long time ago. But God in God's grace not only kept our trifling selves alive, but still decides to employ us as mouthpieces and ambassadors. Is there anybody here tonight that'll help me praise God for the kind of grace that protects you from what you deserve? I said, is there anybody here tonight that can help me give God glory and honor because when I should have been taken out, he looked beyond my faults, saw my needs, and still gave me a chance to get it right again. That's, that's grace in the garden. It looks like protection. But not only does it look like protection, beloved, it also looks like uh, presence. Let the church say presence. Uh, uh, after the man and the woman have sinned and hidden themselves, the Bible says the voice of the Lord came walking in the garden. How can you hear the voice of the Lord? Because it got some weight to it. The, 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 the voice of the Lord came walking in the garden. The text is written almost in the tone to suggest that this was normal. That God had a daily appointment with the man and the woman and he would come walking through the garden looking for them. I argue this is normal because the man and the woman are now hiding because they know they got an appointment with God. They are hiding and they cover themselves. They are scared and nervous that God's going to show up, or worse, he might not. The grace here is that after they messed up, God still came walking through the garden. They were a disappointment, but God kept his appointment. God help me preach tonight. Aren't you glad that after every time you messed up, you've blown it, that when you step to the mic, God still comes walking and helps you stand. Aren't you glad that even after you've blown it and messed up time and time again, God does not banish you and leave you in silence and solitude. Even when you don't deserve his presence, he's still there. I gotta go. F friends, grace shows up in the garden, just like grace shows up in our lives. God sees 
the troubling potential of anxiety. and How it has the capacity to make us distrust God. Friends, the beauty of a sovereign God is that nothing catches him by surprise. <laughs> God knows his creation. And God is creative in ensuring that his creation can still reflect his glory. So, 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 so God gives grace through protection and through presence. But God also takes a piece of the problem and uses that piece to provide an ultimate solution. He takes a piece of the problem, transforms it, and uses it to provide the solution. After all, this whole mess started with a tree. God decides that the same way it starts is the same way I'm going to solve it. God says that the same way it began, it is uh, the same way it's going to end. They messed up, yes, and they failed and sinned by the tree. But some thousands and centuries, years later, God sends his son to die on the same kind of crime scene. The Bible says uh, that they take my Savior and put nails in his hands. They put nails in his feet. They put a crown of thorns uh, upon his head. And on that Roman cross, he dies one Friday night. He died until the earth began to rock and reel. He died uh, until the moon began to drip like blood. He died until there were those in Jerusalem that got up and walked the streets again. But the good news is uh, that not only did he die, but he was buried in a borrowed tomb. I just want to preach the gospel for a second. But early one Sunday morning, the Bible says there he got up with all power in his hands. And because he lives, you and I can face our tomorrows. Because he lives, all of our fears, they are gone. Because I know who holds the future. Life is worth the living just. Because he lives, is there anybody here that's glad that he died? Is there anybody here that's glad that he got up? If you know that he did, don't let anxiety rob you of your trust. Don't let nervousness pull you from your peace. He that the Son sets free is free indeed. I came to tell somebody, lay down your anxiety and lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? His name is Jesus, if you love him, 